So far we've been dealing with these categorical statements in the so-called standard form. And the standard form is not very normal English, right? It's um, these statements like no, X's, R, Y's. Some creatures who wander through the woods at night are not um, mischievous werewolves or, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, so that's not, that's not how, you know, people normally write or speak. So um, what if we have ordinary statements that form categorical arguments or logical relationships and we want to know um, if they're valid and so on? Um, we can translate or convert or, or rewrite um, ordinary statements in our standard forms. Um, we can just sort of force things to fit that pattern. Remember, it's got to be um, quantifier, subject, copula, predicate, A, E, I, or O. We come up with some pretty weird sounding sentences if we do that, but nevertheless, that means that we, uh, we know how to process them logically. Um, if we can at least relate them to those. I mean, you don't have to always write out the standard form, but if we can at least, at least relate ordinary statements to one of the standard forms. So there are a number of things that can deviate from uh, what we're calling standard. Um, one is that instead of a predicate set, you have something like an adjective. So if you have a statement like, some roses are red, um, right, there's no, red is not, it's not a group of things, right, it's not a set. Um, but we can turn this into a statement that's about sets pretty easily. Um, just change it to some roses are red things. Right? Um, so we make that, um, we can do that rewrite if we need to, or just think of it, right, and, and know how to process uh, such a statement. And the other thing, it's not always, there's not always a, uh, a copula and then a predicate set at all. It's not always all X's are Y's. An ordinary statement might say, uh, that unicorns fly, right, or all unicorns fly. We can, of course, turn that into a uh, standard form, a statement, just by changing all unicorns are, and then you can say things that fly, or flyers, or flying things, or anything like that. Um, so those are pretty, pretty trivial. One that gets kind of strange is if, if we have what's called singular propositions. Singular proposition is about an individual a person or thing, rather than about a group. So if you have a statement like Socrates is a man, then right, that's not about that's not about a group of things. That's about one that's about one person, Socrates. So uh, actually, that's that's original the original categorical syllogism in Aristotle uh, used names like that instead of just all groups. But um, in any case, now we think of it as standard form. They have group, group, right? So. Um, we can just change Socrates into a group. It's the group of people who are Socrates, um, right? It's a group with only one member, a set with one member. Uh, we specifically say, not people, by the way, who are named Socrates, of course, but people who are like that Socrates, right? So just make the group uh, people identical with Socrates. And then um, you get these strange sounding sentence, all people who are identical with Socrates, I abbreviated here, with an equal sign, but um, all people identical to Socrates are men, right? And then you can treat that as an A statement would be the form. Um, you, can, you can do a Venn diagram for it where you shade the subject minus predicate area. Um, it's important that you relate it to an A statement, not an I statement. It's not particular, although, um, well, maybe the original Right, the original Socrates is a man. There are some differences between that and an A statement. That has existential import. We talked about how an A statement, we don't think of this having existential import, but certainly if I say Socrates is a man, it implies that Socrates exists. Um, but you'll get the diagram wrong if you do it as an I statement, because you'll have the X in the intersection of you know people who are Socrates and men, and then that, that's like leaving open the possibility, well, there's this, this person who is Socrates who's a man, but there could be some other person who's Socrates who's not a man, which, of course, is not a logical possibility, right, because there's only one. So you have to instead think of it as an A statement, and so then you're shading the Socrates minus men area so that that's 
So that's empty, right? The Socrates is who are not men. Uh, there's nothing there. Um, and um, similarly, if you've got a negative uh, singular proposition, you still have to treat it as a universal. So if it's Chuck Norris is not a ninja, you can't relate that to you know some people who are Chuck Norris are not ninjas. It has to be no people who are identical with Chuck Norris are ninjas. So that it's a universal and you're shading the intersection of, of Chuck Norris and ninjas, right? So that there's no Chuck Norris who's a ninja. Um, fights ninjas sometimes when he's not actually a ninja. Um, okay, a, a fourth category is if you have uh, adverbial phrases. But let me come back to that because that's a little bit, that's probably the weirdest one of all. Um, you can have a situation where there's no quantifier explicitly mentioned, but it's implied. So if I say ants are insects, um, I'm not sure how you know this. It's, it's not exactly part of the grammar, but you know that I don't mean some ants are insects, right? Ants are insects. Something like that, I would mean the whole group, right? So that's a universal. All ants are insects. Whereas if I say cars are passing by, that doesn't mean all the cars in the universe are passing by, passing you by. That means some cars are things that are passing you by. Um, so that one we would treat as an I state. Now, I, I don't think I'll put something like that on the test because it's not exactly a grammatical feature that tells you which, which quantifier is intended. It's something about the statement itself. So uh, it involves knowledge outside of you know, just the logic of it. Um, the other thing is you can have quantifiers that are non-standard quantifiers. So if you say not all, like not all babies are cuties, um, that's the denial of the A statement, all babies are cuties, right? So um, if you're denying the A statement, we saw earlier that the, the contradictory of an A statement is an O statement. So if you're denying that all of them are, that means some are not. So we could rewrite that as some babies are not cuties. It's also a sort of a quantifier if you say there are, or you know, such things exist as. Um, and you know, we could come up with more and more. I'm not going to try to list every possible quantifier. But if you said there are ugly babies, that's also equivalent to saying some, right? So some, it, we think of some as at least one. So there are is the same thing. Some babies are ugly things. <laughs> we just rewrite it that way. Um, true, most actually. Um, <laughs> now, um, you'll find in the book, I believe it talks about a few and several, which um, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to skip those, because if you rewrite a statement using a few or a statement using several as a sum statement, then you'll get argument you'll get arguments correct, and you'll get logical relationships correct, correct because it's partial. Uh, it's, so it's not about the whole category when you say some, or when you say few, or, or several. But it is, um, it is different than some. So I, I don't, uh, right, several or a few does mean more than one, I think. Although I defended earlier in the semester that some we can interpret reasonably as meaning at least one. So I, I would just leave those out. Um, Another category is when you have conditionals, but they're really stating categorical relationships. So earlier in the semester when we talked about a statement like, if you ace the test, then you pass the class, I could be talking about a specific person when I say you, right? So if you, Bob, ace the test, then you pass the class. But it also sometimes can mean uh, anyone who passes the class, or who aces the test, right? So, you know, traditionally you would say one, um, when I was going to school, we learned you're supposed to say one instead of you, but uh, now it's become standard that people just say you. Um, uh, but if one aces the test and one passes the class, if we just make it clear, it's categorical. Um, so that means it applies to any individual person that if that person aces the test, then they pass the class. So all people who ace the test are people who pass the class, or to abbreviate, all acers are passers. And now, 
we're going to have all the same issues with conditional statements that we had in the previous section of the class, where um, there's all these different ways to state conditionals that can be confusing. Um, I don't have to put the if part at the beginning. It's still the if part, right? If I say one passes the class if one aces the test, right? Which is the same thing as saying if you ace the test, you pass the class. So acing the test is a sufficient condition of passing the class. Not doesn't mean it's a necessary condition. Um, so that, once again, is all acers are passers. And then there's only if, right? Remember when we were talking about actual conditionals, about, about a, not, a, not about a category, um, only if signified the consequent. So if you say one passes the class only if one aces the test, um, that means if it was a conditional, the only if part would be the consequent, right? Um, the only way you could ace the test is if you also end up passing the class. Sounds strange, but communicates the same thing. So that means that everyone who passes the class had to have aced the test, right? Or just think of it as a necessary condition. Acing the test was a necessary condition for passing the class, so all passers are acers. Everybody who passes must have aced the test.